Well, hello, everyone. I'm Tyler Cressman, and welcome to the Cressman Conversation. Today on the podcast, we're going to talk about the separation of church and state. We're going to do a little overview of that deep dive kind of into the phrase, where it comes from, what it means, how it should be viewed in the modern context. That's what we're going to be talking about. And I feel as though the most important place to start is... By reading the First Amendment, which is where most people think that this phrase springs from. So here is the First Amendment as it is written. Congress Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, that is the First Amendment of the... United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights. What does it mean? The First Amendment was authored by James Madison, who we actually have to thank for the Bill of Rights in the first place. He didn't think that the Constitution did enough to protect individual rights, so he advocated for the Bill of Rights, which is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. And he wrote, I believe, a number of them. Definitely the first one. I don't know how many others, but it was this was his idea. So the First Amendment of the Constitution gave us what is called the Establishment Clause. And it goes back to that text. Congress Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment or of religion. What that means is that the federal government at the time was not permitted to establish a national church like they had in England. There's the National Church of England. And the founders did not want there to be a national church of the United States. So that's what the Establishment Clause is. It says Congress is not going to make a law respecting the establishment of a religion. And what that has been interpreted to mean is that Congress cannot make a law that grants favor to a certain religious institution at the expense of another one, or it it can't play favorites. So it can't establish a national church, and it can't play favorites among religions because everyone in the United States has the ability and the freedom to practice whatever religion that they so choose. And this establishment clause has often been misunderstood to think that there can be absolutely no intersection between religion, and the government. This law does not prevent religious people from holding public office. It does not prevent religious people from promoting their religion or trying to say, like, for example, a group of Catholics can get together and oppose abortion, and that's not that has nothing to do with the Establishment Clause. So people are allowed to be religious and political at the same time. That's, there is nothing inherently against the Constitution about saying that. And in fact, John Adams said that our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. And the idea that all the founders were incredibly anti-religion is not really true. It kind of is true that they're not Christians in the modern sense of the world. A lot of them didn't go to church, but people typically didn't go to church as often in those days as they do now. But a lot of them are very religious, and all you have to do is read their writing to understand this. They are they use the the phrase God and Lord constantly in their writing, and even the Declaration of Independence says that we are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. So there is not a thing in the Constitution that says that people who are religious cannot also be political. What people seem to misunderstand and where this phrase, the separation of church and state, comes from, it actually comes from a letter a personal letter that was written by Thomas Jefferson in 1802 to the Danbury Baptist Association. The Danbury Baptist Association, oh man, really butchered that word, association, wrote a letter to the newly minted President Jefferson and said that they were worried that they were being persecuted for their religious beliefs by other congregations that were not Baptist in their area. And Thomas Jefferson wrote back and said, that it, actually, we'll just read the line 
where the phrase separation of church and state comes from. So here's what Thomas Jefferson said, where this phrase separation of church and state actually comes from in his letter to the Danbury Baptist Association. It says, Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign, uh, sovereign reverence the act of the whole American people which declare that their legislature should make no law establishing, respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Adhering to this expression of the supreme will of the nation in behalf of the rights of the conscious, I sh shall see with sincere satisfaction the progress of those sentiments which tend to restore man all his natural rights, convinced that he has no natural right in opposition of his social duties. That's where it comes from. Also, I don't know if you noticed a lot of S words in there, having some trouble. That was like Sally selling seashells. I, S's are hard to say. But that's where that phrase comes from, separation of church and state. And it is in no official document, nothing to do with the United States Constitution, whatever. It is written in this letter. And in this letter, it is not saying that there is a wall that prevents the United States from having anything to do with religion. What it's saying is there is a wall that prevents discrimination about religion. That's what he's saying in that phrase means. It doesn't mean that religious organizations cannot be political or that religious people cannot be political. That is not what it means. The reason why, obviously, we are talking about this today is because a lot of people have been talking about this in the Roe versus Wade context, that the overturning of that is some sort of creeping theocracy, some sort of Christian regime is going to come in and, and this is actually an infringement on women's rights in the name of religion. I don't actually see it that way because I think that there is a secular case that you can make for abortion. I, and, and basically the government has a rule that says that the, the government can't make a law that has, it favors one religion over the other, or it has nothing to do, there's no secular case to be made, but it, it is exclusively a religious case to be made for that law. And I don't think abortion falls into that category. I think that there's actually, there can be a secular argument around abortion. So that, that really doesn't apply. But we're actually, what I actually am talking about is another Supreme Court case, which didn't get a lot of, as much coverage. It got a lot of coverage, but it didn't get as much coverage. And that is Carson versus Macon. So the Supreme Court just decided this case around a school district in Maine. Basically, in Maine, half of the school districts in the state don't have public schools. 143 out of 160 school districts actually do not have a public school in the district. So Maine has a program. It's the most rural state in the country. Maine has a program that says that basically they fund the students and the students can do with their education funding as they want. So, for example, you're a student, you get your parents, not you, but your parents will get money, and they can use that money to work on transportation to a nearby school district, which is what a lot of them do, or they can take that money and go to a private school and do with it what they want. And basically, there were some people who were taking that money and wanted to go to private religious schools, and then there was a big ordeal because they were saying, well, the government can't fund a religious school that because of the separation of church and state. And the Supreme Court just actually ruled against that and said, no, they can because this is actually not the government favoring a religion. What the government is doing is giving money to a person and the person can choose where they want to go. And if they want to be a religious person, we're not going to actually discriminate against them, which is what that ruling was about. They said we are, it would actually be discriminatory to not fund the religious school when we fund all the sectarian schools around the, the secular schools if we actually said that well if you're jewish you can't go to the jewish school that's actually discrimination and i think it was rightly decided because to me the separation of church and state is the most misunderstood and misused phrase that people who know nothing use constantly and i used to use it the same way it's it's actually a deeper understanding that you need to have of the phrase where it comes from and what it means to actually understand why it's not accurate. So the Supreme Court has come down on the side of religious liberty. I always have to say this because I always find it very interesting.
but I am not religious. I'm not a religious person. So when I sit up here and defend religion, it's kind of interesting to me. It's like when I sat up here and defended, uh, did podcast and defend Donald Trump and say, I'm not like some hardcore Republican Trump loving guy. I'm not that person, but I'll defend him when he does something good. I feel like that with religion. This is actually a good ruling because religious liberty is important. People should be able to do what they want, and we shouldn't discriminate against someone because they're religious. So anyway, I, I wanted to just do a little bit of a dive into that. It's a, it's a brief one, but it's important to understand where that phrase comes from and what it doesn't mean. And what it doesn't mean is that the government can't have anything to do with religion, period. The government can't discriminate on religion. It can't choose. It can't favor one over the other. But it doesn't mean that there is nothing that the government can do or that religious people don't have a place in government or society. That's not what it means. Everyone brings their own personal moral codes to politics. Every single person is a human being. So when Nancy Pelosi stands at the podium and says she's a Catholic, we have to believe her, that she is going to bring what she views as her Catholic values to her world, which is politics. And same with Joe Biden and the same with someone like Ted Cruz. All these people who are religious, who get elected, they bring different moral codes to their political realm. And that's okay. Though It doesn't say you're religious, you can't be involved in the government. It does say we can't favor one religion over the other. That's it, period. We can't favor one religion over the other and we can't discriminate on about religion or people who practice. So anyway, we're going to leave it there for the day. I am going to be off work for a little bit, so I'm going to try and do a couple of these. I'm going to catch up on some news and try and find some interesting topics. I always want suggestions. Anyone who wants to throw me some suggestions, those are always fun, always a good time. But for right now, we're going to leave it there for the day. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. I'm Tyler Cressman, and I'll catch you on the next one.